Hello everyone and welcome back to the Commander Clash podcast where the Commander Clash crew talks about all kinds of commander stuff and we have a super fun topic this week. Today we're talking about weird old cards that we still play or that we've played recently and joining me to discuss these super weird old cards is Phil. How's it going today Phil? Hey oh, jumping in again on the cast and I can't listen to it this episode which kind of sucks because it's a pretty <laughs> cool topic. <laughs> It is, I'm excited for this one. We got a pretty sweet list of really interesting cards to talk about. And we also have Budget Commander, probably better known as Domer. How are you today, Domer? I'm great. Honestly, this is like what I was made for, this topic. Like I look at my Commander decks and I run too many. Like I'm, I can only talk about like a couple. But yeah, these were just a couple off the, off the top of my head. But like, yeah, I love, I love weird old cards. That's like, that's almost my brand. <laughs> That's it, like the best part of Commander, right? It's the format yeah. where you can play all these weird old cards that you can't yeah. play in Legacy or Vintage or whatever, but you can jam them in a Commander deck and sometimes I might actually do cool things. So, and I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive. And before we get into all these super weird old cards, a quick word from our sponsor. First, today's show is brought to you by Ultimate Guard, premium protection for your trading cards. All the gaming accessories we use on this channel are supplied by Ultimate Guards. And if you want to flick your cards silky smooth like me, check out UltimateGuard.com. And today, show is also brought to you by card with the easiest way to sell your magic cards and if you want to skip all the time and typing of buy listing you can do it with card conduit with their curated service you can send in as many cards as you want with a buy list value of a dollar or more and pay just a five percent service fee you can also use their sorted service where you list and sort your cards in advance and pay just two percent either way you're going to get a detailed report in a fast payment once your order is processed and you can even get another 10 percent off by heading over to cardconduit.com slash mtg goldfish Thanks to Card Conduit for supporting the show today. We also have, before we jump into this week's topic, our ultimate guard question of the week from last week's podcast. And there's kind of actually two. The first one I had to mention because it is a good point from at TPZ. says, small pedantic point. Why do you call it the ultimate guard question of the week and not comment of the week? It's never once question. been a question. <laughs> LOL. Typo in the ad copy. It would be pretty meta if this got top comment. Just saying. So uh, you did it, TPZ. It's pretty meta. It is the top comment end of the week. And that is a good question that I don't actually know the answer to. I it's a <laughs> typo <laughs> in the ad read. <laughs> you got him. <laughs> Yeah, it might be a typo. It might be a typo in the ad read. The yeah. other top comment of the week is uh, from Geek and Seek at Geek and Seek. Krim, I'll vote, uh, this was the dog podcast, the dog bracket. Krim, I'll vote for the cuter one. Phil, I'm scared of dogs, so I'll vote for the better card. Tomer, can't they all be winners? Such a fun dynamic on this episode. So uh, I got to say, like the dog podcast. By the way, I, I didn't choose to be on this. I got asked because I filled in. <laughs> I, this was probably the last topic where you need somebody who is somehow scared of dogs. I like them, but... Also, to be fair, we did not scared. know ahead of time before we recorded that Phil was scared that of is, dogs. Yeah, I, so. I, I, I jumped in on this one. Phil, how do you Just feel about like cats if we're doing a sequel? <laughs> yeah, it's... Are you scared I'm not as scared, but they are, I mean, they're killers. You, maybe you should be scared. <laughs> They're just they not big they enough to kill, kill you. Humans. But if they, ooh, if they were I, big enough, like a tiger, Jesus Christ! I, I have a 175 pound dog and like a 15 pound cat, and I am way more scared of the cat. Yeah. Maybe that's <laughs> cats are like devious. Phobias. They are devious. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> they scratch you. But anyway, uh, thank you for sending in all your comments or questions. I guess maybe if you want a chance to be a question of the week, even if it's just a comment and not a question, make sure to leave a comment on this week's episode and. Maybe you'll get picked for next week's Ultimate Guard comment of the week. So let's get into our topic for today, which is weird old cards. Wait a second. Still I got it. I got it. Sorry. The first no, question good. of the week that was actually a question was the question why the question is never a question. <laughs> if that is. Well, that was the okay, question of the like... week. We've done yeah, it. Yeah, we did it. Got there. <laughs> meta. The, the, the meta. funny thing is, yeah, now technically it is the question of the week because that was a question, so that comment's <laughs> wrong, right. right? We actually did do a question <laughs> for this one. <laughs> wow, it's super meta. Anyway, let's talk weird old cards. Tomer, you're up first. Hit us with a weird old card that you uh, still love playing. Okay, like I said... Uh... I, I love weird old cards. I run as many of them as possible. I even had a Twitter thread that 
I lost. But like I have a really long Twitter chain where I retweet over and over again. And I have just like a bunch of like old I went for budget. So I went for like underrated weird cards under like five dollars or something like that. Um but there was one that that I never got around to adding until my most recent deck, and that is City of Shadows. City of Shadows is from the dark, I believe. I believe that's what yep. the symbol means. It's a land that it taps. You can sacrifice one of your creatures. Well, you can exile one of your creatures, rather. Uh, put a counter on City of Shadows. Let me actually read the Oracle text, because that would be a little bit easier. Uh, so City of Shadows, land, you can tap it, exile a creature you control, put a storage counter on City of Sa Shadows, and then you can tap it and add one colorless for each storage counter on City of Shadows. So by itself, it is a land that taps for zero mana. It doesn't do anything until you exile a creature with it, and then it will finally start tapping for mana. And if you want it to tap for more mana, you have to tap it and exile another creature first. And it's like a whole, it's terrible. It's awful. However, I recently made a Venser poison deck that runs a ton of proliferate cards. And the whole gimmick of the oh. deck, the main uh, benefit of Venser is whenever you proliferate and Venser's on the battlefield, you get to make a Hollow One uh, legendary creature artifact token. So I'm proliferating like crazy in this deck. I have every single proliferate card basically in the deck. Uh, I'm going to be making expendable tokens all the time and I'm sacrificing it for value. So in this, in the context of this deck, uh, I will be using City of Shadows to exile the Karn Struck that I'm making with Venser, putting a storage counter on it. And then instead of like sacrificing more creatures, I'm just proliferating. So in this context, it's actually an incredibly strong uh, ramp engine in the deck. It's like a build your own ancient tomb plus plus in the deck um and it's super exciting it's very expensive because it's on the reserved list uh oh, but is. it is um mm, it is it yeah is like 50 bucks there. almost or something yes. yeah but if so you bought it you know in like the, the 2016 it would have been like three bucks <laughs> so, <laughs> yay so I'm, I'm, <laughs> this kind of card is exactly what i wanted to listen and not be part of this <laughs> podcast i guess i listen while being part of it so I heard what you said, never seen the card. I do play a Jadar deck that gives me a zombie every turn that I can just, I plan on do sacrificing it. it. Yeah, oh, yeah. It. Then I looked at the price and saw, oh, that is like 30 to 40 bucks in <laughs> Germany. It's very beat up if you get it for Prince 30. Or <laughs> unless, unless you're Italian or don't mind Italian cards because there is an Italian, the dark version of it that is, you get a... Light plate one for seven bucks. Get it while it's hot. The next one is already Whoa. nine bucks. I that card is if it would be cheaper, I would try it in Jada. That seems if you have Urbok or something, it taps for mana as well. Yeah. So it's, it's fine. I don't own an Urbok, but maybe I should I mean, get the Urbok first and then get this. But this is like that's what I'm looking for <laughs> for this cast. <laughs> it's so cool. So it's also a land that's a free sack outlet, right? Like, I mean, I guess well, so. It is oh, exile. exile. It is exiling it, which is a bit of a drawback. But I could imagine, like, uh, Hezazan Tamar or something could be a home. Like, you make a bunch of kind of useless tokens. You want to be able to get Hezan off the battlefield before its trigger resolves. So you can use this and it goes back to the command zone. What about, like, an Eldrazi spawn token style deck? Like, is this worth it? Just to, if you're making a bunch of not very powerful tokens, like this eventually gets pretty big, right? I'm trying to think of homes outside of proliferate because it does ingrain proliferate, but in some decks, if you can just like sack a couple of tokens early in the game, you got a bitter blossom going or something. Once this is tapping for two, it's like kind of insane. And if you ever get above two, then it's like busted, right? Ancient Tombs is a staple and you got to spend two life. I think my last commander clash, I spent 22 life tapping Ancient, ancient Tomb. I would have loved to have this card that would let me make the mana without killing myself yeah you, you no, need to, to tap for one first which needs yes. you to get a creature without having mana from this land drop so that it is a little slow but yeah. damn is it just tech <laughs> it's Out, looks yeah. cool as outside of proliferate and outside of like like you know, like between zero to three color decks i would run this i think like i remember we put it in our traxa comp compilation deck i don't know who put you, it in there you I, <laughs> wow. in I, our I, traxa I compilation i deck. really hope not but yeah so <laughs> tapping for colorless in a color in a four color deck 
not that great, not that useful. Um, but in like a one color deck, two color deck, for sure. Colorless, like, yeah, it's good. But yeah, you do have to take off two turns if you're using it fairly and exiling two things before it come, becomes an ancient tomb, which is really bad. But like, you do it once in a proliferate deck, and oh my goodness, it is value town. What is its color identity? Because it has this weird black border, just like colorless. other old lands have. The... It is colorless. It's colorless, it's, yeah. It's the border. kind of like blackish, and other lands from this. That's dark, baby. Everything's Every, dark. Yeah. There's no, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 not everything. <laughs> like other have. old border, like uh, <laughs> there's other cards here that are also colorless <laughs> now that I see them. No, it's just <laughs> the dark, I guess. Well, what's, old what's, your, what's your old card? Yeah, Phil. Then, Phil? When How dark is up? Uh, with one of your I actually old, old cards. got one here that the other cards are stuff I play in my paper decks. But if you watch the recent or next, oh, we played it yesterday. I don't know episode of Commander Clash where Seth and me as well burn us a lot with ancient tombs. I also play a card called Retraced Image, and I play it on turn one, which is probably the best way to do it. It is. One blue, reveal a card from your hand, then put this card into play if it has the same name as a permanent in play. Not good in Commander usually because it's a singleton format unless you play a lot of islands. And that is technically still not too good because Explore draws a card and you can put a land into play, put a bounce land into play, ramp like crazy. That's green things though. And if you're mono blue, you're also drawing a bunch of cards. So this isn't, the card disadvantage doesn't really matter if you draw a bunch of cards and then you just need mana to cast these cards and get cards out of your hand. This might be... So we've seen it. Spoiler alert, I got it. I had I kept it in the, in the hand with an island and then I drew an island and I was like, ooh, that seems like... Never punish. Whole... I don't know. It's it, it punish. was cool. Hmm. Maybe it's just cool. That's an old... How good is... How good is this card, Tomer? So this is a card for me that I've heard people talk about. Like, if you listen to, like, the deep, dark depths of the Commander internet, you'll have these people who are like, oh, you know, Retrace Image, Blue Ramp, I think this card's really good. That was I've me. Never actually, <laughs> I've, well, it might have been your Twitter, actually, come to Stop think of it. Stop calling me out, Seth. <laughs> but, but I've never actually seen it go off yeah. in practice. It seems like, uh, like, in theory, it's like, wow, turn one Blue Ramp. How much does it actually work, Tomer? Like, I know I know you've talked about this card before. Is it consistent enough that you can just jam this in a mono blue deck as one of your ramp spells? I was such a diehard fan of this card, like, a couple years ago. But but I think it's still... It's not as good as I thought it was. Or maybe it got a little bit power crept out these days. But I do think, like, like, like Phil mentioned, that if you're drawing enough cards and you're in mono blue and you run enough basics, <coughs> Seth... Um, then, then it's actually legitimate. I, I still like it in Spellslinger decks, you know, like if I, I had it originally, the original home for it was, uh, like in 20, when I made my first budget commanders on the site, which is like when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, I put it in <laughs> Tower and Sky Summoner because it's a cheap spell that generates a Drake at the very least. And yeah, the deck is all about card draw. So I don't really care about the card disadvantage. I just want the ramp aspect of it. And it was running like 30 something islands. So it was fine. <laughs> Odds are I had a second island to put onto the battlefield. So I think if you can utilize, you know, um, if you're like in a blue landfall deck, like Cosima is a great choice for this too. You put an additional land and then Cosima's on its uh, on, on the journey. And when it comes back, it draws you an extra card as well too, because of the landfall trigger. That's really good. Really good in Moonfolk. If you're another Moonfolk uh, aficionado like like I am, uh, Spellslinger. Yeah, it's fine. It's not like a staple of Mono it, Blue. Yeah, it's very clever. Wrong. Yeah. Yes. It's, and it feels it's good. cool to play, when but it, it's not game breaking. When it works, you definitely feel like the smartest person at the table because yes. you're just like, you, you did it with the thing. And yeah, I think I just don't play enough basics to run this in most of my decks. You do need like the more basics, the better it gets, right? Because we're yeah. playing Commander, a singleton format. So outside of basic lands, Outside of very, I don't even know if there's like some weird way you could somehow make this I mean, work with another card. Right? 
as yeah, I guess if you're petitioners, it, it uh, would work. Be spy to... Kit. I, I know some some uh, oh, esteemed gentlemen true. played Spy Kit true, recently true, true. on a Commander Clash, even. Um, and that's, that's true. really cute when you can just oh, start yeah, putting in anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'd be like creature. It has every creature name, so you just play oh, that's any creature from your hand so, on the battlefield. So, you know, clones I made work a big... too. You know, if you have like a, a, a clone of something on the battlefield, and for some Ooh, reason yeah. you have the original in your hand, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. You can game it a little bit. Extra value seems, out of it. Yeah. Unlikely. It, it's also any Ooh. permanent on the battlefield too. So sometimes, like, oh well, I don't have an extra. I I don't have an extra. You can island. play your soul ring for one blue. <laughs> yeah. You could, no. Well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it has all right. Let's. Bananas. Let's let's move on for my first pick. And this is a card that I've done like two 180s on. This is a card that I used to play pretty much every deck when I first started playing Commander. Then I thought the card was downright bad and played it in zero decks for like years. And just recently, I've sort of rediscovered it and started to put it in quite a few decks again. And that card is Mind's Eye. So Mind's Eye is from original Mirrodin block. So we're talking 20 years ago now. And Mind's Eye is a five mana artifact that says... Whenever your opponent draws a card, you can pay one and you get to draw a card. And I have come around on this just being a really solid card advantage engine again. I don't know why I ever didn't like this card. Yes, I know it's five mana to get going, but it feels so good to have on the battlefield. Once you have it down, you have these turns where you like, you have like six mana or seven mana. And the thing you want to play is like five mana. And you're just like, okay, normally this mana would just kind of go to waste. But instead, I'm going to turn it into a couple of extra cards. It lets you leave up anything at instant speed, counter spells, flash things. If you want to flash it in, you can. If not, when your opponent's drawn, their draw step you can draw some extra cards so i'm not crazy enough to say you should jam this in any deck or anything but especially decks that have any sort of artifact synergies i like this in that was the last deck i played it in was actually a mono blue artifact style deck and i was really impressed with it and i've even won richard over richard's not here today but richard has started jamming it into decks after seeing me jam into decks That's and seeing nice. how many cards i was drawing with it so so i am fully back on the mind's eye train being good and this is a card i looked on edh rec one percent i swear like a decade ago this was yeah. one of the most popular card advantages engines in the format or like it was at least fairly heavily played and now it's not played at all so Tomer, i know you're i see you shaking your head are you not not on the minds i train yet watch the if last episode like, the if you are like ramp dot deck mm -hmm. if you have more mana than you have any idea on what you should be using it for let's say you're like mono green just land and play it in artifact decks they always no. have mana it's... no if if i if i if I construct a deck where my one of my better options of drawing cards is Mind's Eye, I restart and I, I start from scratch. I throw the deck into the trash and I try again. I can't. I cannot get behind this. I. I'm sorry, Seth. This is you're on a path that I cannot follow. I can't. <laughs> I can't. It's I so mana inefficient. Come on, how Bill. Come on. I tried it in the Target Slam time? deck, and I had it. And I drew hella cards. It was a big mana deck. Mono black artifacts. Is a the mana. first card yeah, you draw just, is six I, mana. The two uh, cards is seven mana. Tastes, when you start breaking it, it down, oh, over time, you pay eight mana into this and you draw three and then you're feeling good about it. No. No. I refuse. You just forget. Here's the thing. You just play it and forget about the mana cost and then it's like yeah. what one mana one card what a bargain and then it's just just work from there <laughs> just feel I, pretty good and then you just I, tap all your resources to draw a few cards and then you die because you haven't produced i was gonna do this anyways <laughs> I know it looks really slow and I know it looks really bad, but if you think about it, like over the course of a game, it's not threatening enough for people to blow up. So it actually, even though it starts off slow, it often ends up being like 10 mana draw five cards or 11 mana draw five cards, which I know doesn't sound efficient, but there's a big value to having it split up and being able to have control over it. Like paying one to draw one card is actually a pretty efficient rate for drawing cards. So once you get past that initial like five mana investment, I think it's actually a really good card. And if you're playing an artifact deck, like you make a lot of mana, like you have a lot of mana rocks, you have enough mana to get it on the battlefield fairly quickly. So I don't know. I, I still really like Mind's Eye quite a bit. I, so. just, I don't like the idea of spending that much money 
or not money that that much <laughs> mana that spending it is, is cheap. very cheap it's very very cheap i is you spend that much mana to not progress your board state like that is that's the main thing for me like i like Rex my card draw engine state. be like put like my welcoming vampire three mana investment is there that all the card draw don't have to pay more mana i can spend that mana to interact with the board develop my board you know do things and the mind's eye the thing that 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 grinds my gears is when like somebody plays mind's eye they tap out basically or they have a couple extra mana afterwards and then they spend all their turns just spending mana to draw cards but then they die because they have nothing they're just not doing anything right they just have an empty board spending this man on mind's eye and then like okay great you have cards good job i i swing at you you die okay we're we're <laughs> We're all going to die, Tomer. It's not about how we die. It's about yeah. how we live. And I live drawing cards, so I love <laughs> mine. <mind's> eye. <laughs> all right. Fine. Oh, Tomer, it's your turn. Give us another another <laughs> weird old card that you play. Okay, this isn't, this isn't like an underrated gem, I don't think, unless, I guess, you don't know about this card. And then I'm very happy to inform you that if you're in a zombie deck or any sort of self-mill deck, this is a, a card you should definitely be picking up. Uh, this is Tombstone Stairwell. This is a four mana double black, um, two and double black enchant world, which is, I just love that. Uh, it's from uh, Mirage Block. It has cumulative upkeep, one in a black. So on your next upkeep, you have to pay one in a black, and then you uh, have to pay an additional one in a black every single uh, subsequent turn. You put like a ice counter on it? What? I forget. It's some sort of counter, some weird counter on it. Anyway. Yeah. It costs mana to keep it around. But the main thing is, at the beginning of each upkeep, if Tombstone Stairwell is on the battlefield, each player creates two, two, uh, a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token with haste named Tomb Spawn for each creature card in their graveyard. So every single upkeep, all of us at the table are going to be making some amount of 2-2 two, two black zombie creature tokens with haste. And then at the beginning of each end step, or when Tombstone Stairwell leaves the battlefield, destroy all tokens created with Tombstone Stairwell. They can't be regenerated. Now, this looks like a lot of people will look at this card and be like, okay, I get to make a couple zombies on my turn and attack with it if I have a couple creatures, but then my opponents have blockers because they also have some zombies. Who cares, right? Well, first of all, it happens at every single person's upkeep. And second of all, it's not actually about attacking with these zombies. These zombies are dying every single turn. You're having a bunch of zombies being created every single turn. My turn, your turn, everybody's turn. And then they die at end step. So if you're in an aristocrats deck or especially zombie decks, zombie decks are all about whenever a zombie dies, you get to ping your opponent, you drain them with Diagraph Captain and under under Undead Gladiator. It's like one of the, there's like 50 of diff those different ones. Any mono black aristocrats yeah. deck too has blood artist effects and stuff like that where when stuff is dying, you get to drain everybody. And this is happening every single turn a bunch of times right like if you have a bunch of like death trigger effects an entire turn cycle you're going to be swimming in death triggers and that's what makes it so low-key powerful is you're getting a billion death triggers it's great that's another mono black card for my jadar deck that i would love yes, to find room so for good in <laughs> it's so good in zombies this was like the first one of the first cards i added to my my paper zombie deck before i took it apart but even to this day oh my goodness is it good it's also reserve list though so but have a cumulative upkeep you pay first upkeep you first upkeep you pay two, two. you put in second eight, upkeep, yeah, four. Pay four yes Three, but up, the game's the Usually when you play Tombstone Sierra, the game is usually over in like two turns. If it sticks around, your, yeah, if you've got a your, your blood artists are sure. going to murder yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's the main thing yeah. with Tombstone Sierra. Well. Yeah, and the thing I like about Beth it is, is even though it's a symmetrical <laughs> effect, I well, so I am convinced. I, I like where you're heading with it. I think I would definitely consider playing it in some sort of like graveyardy aristocrat deck. So you do need like to fill up your graveyard essentially. So you do need both of those things where you're like filling your graveyard and like aristocrat synergies. But if you hit that mark, it's really good. The thing I like about it is there's really two things. So first, even though it's symmetrical, in theory, you're gonna be building your deck with this in mind, and your opponents probably aren't. So you should be getting more value out of it than your opponents will. And if it does go wrong somehow. 
you can always just not pay the cumulative upkeep eventually and get it off the battlefield. So if it's not going to like actually be able to win you the game, the tokens are temporary anyway. So it seems really hard to lose. So yeah, I can imagine if I'm playing like a Sir Conrad deck or maybe a Will Held deck, like something along those lines, this seems like a really, really nice addition that I'm going to have to try playing. I don't think I've ever played this card, but I think you've won me over to uh, to trying it at least. I wasn't sure if this What's was the most money I definitely know it's good. How much, how much money can you pay on an upkeep? No, how much was the longest time? Like, how many zombies, how many to counters were on that? Did you pay eight, ten mana? Oh, Jeez. I think the, like, the, it's been a long time since I played my zombie deck. Um, but uh, I remember mostly the time, if I put down two plus Sierra World, the game was over after, like, three turns maximum. Yeah, a, because it's just so much, so much gets, drain. Yeah. And then also... Ten, yeah. Yeah, and then also, if it comes back to your turn, my deck was a self-mill zombie deck. Like, I was playing Verena yeah. with the last iteration, so I always had way more zombies than any of my opponents, and then I could also crush them just in combat as well, too. But yeah, Bill. fun. Interesting card. I like it. Uh, my next card... Oh, that's... <laughs> so, old cards have a thick old wording, I would call it, which is usually, like, ramp was untapped, like Nature's Law... Sky Shroud Claim or Harrow or Bounce could target itself and lands like Mana War and uh, Boomerang. Untap effects could untap the artifact or creature themselves. Ristic Study is just not meant for Commander. Other cards as well. Mm. This card is just, they would, they like, even for back then, this is weird wording. And people might say, like, coming from us, that's not a niche card. But if you look, at people who are not involved in the degenerate fog matter, they might not know the card Glacial Chasm. It's technically a land. Also, cumulative upkeep, pay to life. It doesn't tap for mana. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice a land. You cannot attack. There's one good part, though. All damage dealt to you is reduced to zero, and that's damage from... If you deal damage to yourself, that's... It's it's gone, and if the opponent wants to kill you, they gotta drain you or combo off. It is so I play it in land fall style decks. Don't put it in as a land slot. It's like maze of it. It doesn't mm. have for mana. It even sacrifices a land. But if you're ramping like crazy, you might be able to afford it. You can search it out with crop rotation. What Richard did though is play it in just random decks, just so. He can price of progress without getting damaged. And it worked. <laughs> so now I guess it's like good on you if you find room for a glacial chasm to play in the very crucial last turn of the game to not make it your last turn. What a weird card though. Like, it might be a little uncreative for us, but because we play it a lot, I guess. But for the regular magic player, if they read this card, they definitely say it's a weird old card and what the hell why? The last line of text is pretty cool, obviously, but my god. I hate this card so much. I hate it yeah, so really? much. Brutal. Really? Why? I, Not I, play, the I play against land decks way too many times, <laughs> and oh my god, every single land deck that I come across is like, ah, yeah, you wanted to attack me? Very cool. Very interesting. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, uh, I'm going to crop rotation, instant speed, glacial chasm. Uh, yeah. Maybe Arch Druid Charm at uh, Instant Speed yeah. Glacial Chasm. Mm -hmm. Maybe yep. just like any of the other ways to this up it, it, in a green it's... deck. Yeah, it's just mm -hmm. fun. Great. And then, oh, okay, now you just can't attack me. Oh, by the way, the next card I'm going to be tutoring up is going to be Feel of the Dead. I'm going to make an infinite mm -hmm. number of zombies. Oh, mm -hmm. you want to blow up? You want to blow up my chasm? Well, most removal spells don't interact with lands. I'm so sorry. But if you use like a generous gift or something on my glacial chasm, guess what? A land deck, the number one thing they're doing is recurring lands because obviously they want to replay all the fetch lands from the graveyard. So they get to do it for free. You know, it's like, oh, thank you. You gave me an extra lane fall trigger. How nice of you. Oh, you want to exile it? Sorry, you can't. You have to destroy this and then exile the graveyard. I hate it. I hate it so much. I hate it so much. 
Oh my god! I love how it does yeah. even oh do my god. the remotest it's... part of what a land is supposed to do. I hate but... it. <laughs> no, it do doesn't even make any mana. It doesn't do any any land stuff. I will say, like, so part of what Tomer's saying <laughs> is what makes the card so strong in land decks because it does have a drawback, right? If you have to pay a cumulative upkeep of two life, so the first turn you got to pay two, four, the next turn six, so you can't really keep it along around that long if you're playing it fairly. It's kind of like a temporary, like, couple of turn reprieve usually. But in a lands deck, if you're playing like Lord Windgrace or other like get lands out of your graveyard, you can just choose not to pay the cumulative upkeep and keep putting it back into play and keep this going pretty much forever and just like never be able to die or wait until you eventually have like the big board for the lethal attack and then you just sack it so you can attack again and kill people. So I think this card is actually, this is definitely one of those weird old cards that Watsy would never print today, <laughs> but I do think it's like getting better in commander you mentioned arch druid's charm like the more ways you have to good cards that can put this into play at instant speed the more it goes up in value because then it works like a real fog real. sort of but then you get the upside that maybe it's going to stick around for a couple turns so yeah i i like this card a lot too it is hard to play lands that don't make mana or too many of them but this is one that like in the right deck i think it's worth it plus we got yavmai and urborg and stuff like that which kind of reduces the the pain of playing these maze of it like glacial chasm style lands new ley line yeah any anything like that makes it better so yeah definitely a good choice i got i got one i gotta ask you about so this is a card i don't know if it's too salty so i recently played in it a deck that had a bunch of enchantments and not many creatures in it and i ended up with a card called smoke so smoke is a card printed uh first in alpha actually although it's not on the reserve list so the cheaper versions are like two bucks or three bucks but it's just a double red enchantment that says no player may untap more than one creature during his or her untap phase <laughs> so i was playing a deck that like didn't really have any creatures in it, yeah. so I didn't really care that it was going to, like, mess with my creatures, too. So I was like, this is just kind of like a weird red, like, ghostly prison or something, right? Just drop this, and my opponents aren't going to be able to attack me that much because they're not going to have access to most of their creatures most of the time. And I think it's actually very effective at that job. The only drawback is... It does kind of make people mad, so the creatures that do untap are probably going to be coming at you because you're the one that has the smoke and is stopping the other creatures from untapping. But what do you think? Is this a card that's, like, fair game, or is this too, like, winter orby or whatever? To, uh, is this going to make people too salty if you play this card? I It's a stack. I, of course, people are, it's like a winter orb, but not for lands, I guess, but then people can at, use their lands to kill you. I mean, I'm going to kill you. You can play it, but I'm... Yeah. Yeah, if, if I'm in a deck that wants to be attacking with multiple creatures, then this is the number one threat, right? It has to be removed. But I don't find it salty at all because it's an enchantment. Like, I could just, I could remove it. Unlike Glacial Chasm, I have plenty of <laughs> options to get rid of this thing. I even have exile removal for this little baby. So you know what? Absolutely fine. And it doesn't, like, prevent you from casting spells or anything. It just makes yeah. it very difficult if like I was playing my Akiri Cauldra deck, I need to I need combat damage and I need multiple combat damage with multiple creatures. This card is the number one thing that is stopping my deck from doing its thing. So yeah, you're gonna be attacked, obviously. <laughs> but like, yeah, I think it's totally fair. But I, it's very good. Good to Voltron too. Like if you have just one creature that wants to be attacking ooh, every single turn. Good point. Oh heck right. yeah. Have fun. Or or if, yes, uh, <laughs> Seedborn Muse effects, like if you have other ways of like untapping your stuff that your opponent's stuff's not going to untap, you can uh, you can get around uh, get around it as well. So yeah, I think it suffers from the fact that red is just not like the biggest enchantment color. When I'm thinking of like decks that want enchantress, uh, enchant enchantments, it's usually like green, white, Selesnia style deck. So I think it's just like in a weird color for what it does. But I do think it's a, a pretty interesting option that I'm going to play more of. But mm -hmm. Tomer, we're back around to you. Wait, Give me oh, have God, the Phil. problem that what's the two mana glue enchantment the confounding conundrum like if you don't stack them hard enough you still get the heat but you can't <laughs> support it so. with enough stacks to <laughs> stop them <laughs> this one's more brutal than the conundrum though yeah yeah, yeah it I mean, stops aggro it, but only I don't know. It is a little matchup dependent. Like, it's much better against go wide decks than like Voltron decks or decks with one or two big creatures. So, it is a little bit ma uh, matchup dependent, but it is only two mana. So, it's pretty cheap. And you can always wait until your opponents are like mostly tapped down, kind of the winter orb trip that you do, where if you just run out of winter orb when everyone's mana is open, it doesn't do as much. But if you wait until people are already like they attacked last turn and all their creatures are tapped and then you drop this, you're going to make some people pretty sad that they're on only untapping one creature. But but 
Yeah. Uh, Tomer, what uh, what's next on your weird old cards list? Okay, I have I have one that I think. Um, okay, I have a lot of really weird, very niche ones, <laughs> but I have one that I think like if you're in mono green, uh, you should seriously consider running this one. Uh, this is a enchantment called Gaia's Touch. It's also from the dark, also yes. very dark looking. <clears throat> uh, it is two green, uh, for this enchantment. And oh my god, I'm gonna read the I'm gonna read the oracle text. Uh, you could you could activate this and put a basic forest card from your hand onto the battlefield. Activate this ability only anytime you could cast a sorcery and only once each turn. So it is basically exploration. I believe there's like two, a one mana version of this effect, but you could put any land onto the battlefield, like an extra land drop every single uh, one of your turns. I believe it's exploration. But Gaia's yep. Touch is two mana, and it has an extra ability that says you can sacrifice it at double green. So the downside, obviously, compared to Exploration, is that you have to only put basic forests. So if you're in a multicolored deck, like just do not run this. It's not worth it unless you're like super basic forest heavy. But if you are in like a mono uh, green deck, uh, this is not that big of a downside for you. And then when you run out of lands to play, unlike Exploration, you can actually cash it in to get two mana and cast a bigger spell. And that is what really excites me. Another thing that really excites me is it's $1.65. I remember when I first found it, it was like super, it was like 30 cents or something like that. It's only it's crept up a little bit. Yeah, it's only crept up a little bit. So it's still way cheaper than exploration and burgeoning and all that, that all that stuff. And honestly, I, I've always put it in my mono green decks and I've always been happy to see it. Like outside of mono green, never, but mono green, <clears throat> absolutely. I played yeah, it this once. card's like so underrated. Yeah, I played it in Tatiova Artisan. Oh, it was very convenient that it's a common, and it felt oh, so yeah. good, especially with bounce lands, and then you get forests back. You do have to get forests, but man, that had so much value, and then you can crack it for the ritual. Uh, it's kind of weird that it's not more expensive. Very prohibitively mono green, I guess. Yeah, and even like you got to be mono green with a lot of basic forests. So I think that's like even further narrows it. Although I guess if you're mono green, you probably got enough <laughs> forests to make it work. The Come other on, intriguing Seth, part please. is like the the ritual. I think I have like three forests in my Come mono green back or something. Please. Come on, <laughs> field of the dead. How am I going to turn out my field of the dead? <laughs> but the other thing about this card is just the ritual mode is very explosive. Like if you don't have the forest, you drop this on turn two. You can ramp up to a five drop on turn three by sacking it for two extra mana like that's a huge burst of mana so yeah i think this card even if you don't have enough forest to consistently every single turn for five turns like put an extra one into play you're still gonna get the value out of it where you make an extra land drop or two and then just use it as a, a ritual effect to ramp something big out and it's done its job so yeah i feel like yeah. this is a card that i should definitely play more enchantress decks like sithis mm -hmm. if you just play this and crack it you know mana neutral and you draw a card and gain a life Yep. Oh, yeah. You oh, that's, yeah, that's like a free enchantment, out. essentially, right? Yeah. You just play it and sack it, and yeah, you just yeah. triggered all your stuff. I didn't think about yeah, that. Yeah, that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, yeah. All right, Phil. Oh. Phil, what, what else do you got for us? Well, weird old color pie break that I didn't. I kind of like that. I did consider playing this card a bunch, and I'm kind of scared that sometimes my opponent plays it for no reason, I guess. I wish I at some points I get you with it. It is in my collection already. It is Withering Boon. Two mana, uh, a black and a colorless. It's an instant and it says pay to life counter target creature spell. Mono black creature counter. Nobody's going to expect this. It's obviously not as no. good as a counter spell or whatever. But <laughs> nah. I, I, since I always consider playing this card, I'm kind of scared of it. But nobody else is going to expect you countering their commander in a mono black deck. Too bad it's just creatures. But man, if you pull this off, I'm going to. I got to play this. No, I really got to this... play this. <laughs> I think this card keeps getting better and better because I think like. 
So a few years ago, when I first started thinking about this card, I was like, all right, like, sure, I can play this, but I'm black, so I'm really good at killing creatures. So what's the point of me trying to, like, counter a creature when I can just let it resolve and then use one of my, you know, endless black removal spells to kill it? But we keep getting more and more, like, powerful ETB triggers and creatures that, like, do their damage when they hit the battlefield. So that's where I think this card keeps going up in value for me. Like, think of Dockside Extortion as might be the best example. Like, sure, you're mono black deck can easily kill the dock side but as soon as it hits the battlefield it kind of did its damage and you're super far behind same with like eternal witness is pretty similar like that like it doesn't really the body doesn't matter it's all about the etb trigger so this is a card that i think for me like I'm becoming more and more interested in trying to play this in my black decks over a removal spell, even though you have the timing restriction of having to leave up the mana or whatever, but I think it's going to be worth it just because so many creatures have powerful ETBs now. I think the flexibility of having one of these effects in your deck uh, is is quite nice in a black deck, because I think the two most recent and very popular uh, commander cards that came out recently, Itali Primal Conqueror and the new Attracts, I forget the name of it. Uh, they're both ETB triggers where, like like you said, it doesn't matter that you killed it. Like, yeah, obviously, it's nice that you killed it. But the main thing is the ETB trigger, right? Like uh, getting yep. to attracts or refills your entire hand. And then Atali uh, gets to cast like four spells for free, right? Um, and then also the other fear is that once on the battlefield, these are blink decks, right? So it's just like it's a gamble to even try to kill it because they might just in response blink the creature to this stops it right right before uh, any of the damage is done. And I think, yeah, I, I, I like this. I like this, especially if you are being terrorized in like a, a tally meta or a Traxa meta. This is an easy way to um, give yourself an out in, in black decks that don't have access to blue. Yeah, yeah. The more the more ETB effects you have in your meta, the the further this one goes up in value. I think I I got a good one for y'all. This is a card that I always wonder why don't people play this card more often. And the card is vanishing. So vanishing, it's a one mana blue enchantment that just says for two mana enchanted creature phases out. So we've seen with Teferi's protection and uh, other similar effects how phasing out is the best form of protecting your creatures, right? It gets around everything. Indestructible doesn't stop everything these days. There's just so many ways to deal with creatures. This gets around everything. When you phase a creature out, it is not going to be dealt with that turn. So as far as I'm concerned, this is primary purpose is an amazing way to protect your commander. If you're playing like a Voltron style deck, especially, but really any deck that cares about keeping its commander on the battlefield, this is anytime you're worried about your commander dying, two mana, it's not gonna die. And you can do it again the next turn. I guess it adds up a little bit, the two mana turn, but still, if you're a Voltron deck that is all about using your commander to win the game, it's gonna be worth it to leave up that extra mana. And then you also get this weird, like sneaky value where in a pinch, you can put it on your opponent's creatures and like phase out their Voltron that or phase out there, you know, biggest bomb that's going to be attacking you. So I feel like this card is just like super underrated. And it's a card that you can really jam in almost any deck that really cares about keeping its commander on the battlefield, but goes up in value even more if you have enchantment synergies like Xur or whatever, anything like that, where you're able to tutor this out or find it, Bruna or, uh, or Voltron decks uh, especially. But what do you think? I think you're a fan of this card, aren't you, Tomer? I love this card. I, I, I think you nailed it. Like, if you're in a Voltron deck that really needs its commander on the battlefield, uh, it's very much worth playing Vanishing and then keeping that double blue up. It's a little bit tougher, obviously, in, like, heavy multicolor decks that, you know, keeping up double blue is a little bit awkward sometimes. But, like, the, the deck that I've ran it in recently was Min Wily Illusionist, where the deck is really fun, but if the commander just keeps dying, the deck just falls apart entirely it's not voltron it's just it makes a bunch of illusions and stuff like that but like it really needs the commander on the battlefield so I, I i run vanishing in that because you could repeatedly save it and you also mentioned voltron and i think it's even better in voltron decks because um it actually protects everything that is equipped or enchanted onto it so if somebody like uh austere commands or something like that um, there are spells to give your uh, commander indestructible, but then you're still going to lose the auras and enchantments. However, with phasing, everything that is attached to the creature also phases out. So if somebody is trying to disenchant like your sword or something and you really want to keep it, you can actually just 
activate vanishing and save the sword uh, by vanishing out your creature if it's if it uh, the equipment's attached to it. So I, I really I'll like the... how good it is. Do you think it's more potent as a threat of activation, or do you actually pay this like three times a game because people keep? Ra I mean, Ras, I guess you still need to pay, but I wouldn't target this if you have hmm? mana open. So yeah, good for you. <laughs> I mean, the threat helps, right? Like if you have mana open and your opponent has a removal spell, they're probably not even going to try hmm. to target it because they know it's not going to work. So a lot of times the value is just leaving that two mana up. So like you said, Rast or things like that, you are probably going to need to actually activate it, but it does a lot of work as long as you leave the mana up and it's a blue card. So if you're in blue, you probably have some counter spells or something so you can get value out of leaving your mana up anyway. So it's not going to be a complete waste. So yeah, I think this card's actually just like sneakily really good, but yeah. the anyway. Way the, well, the way, the way I see it played in, in, in games is usually nobody will just, you know, throw a, a removal spell at you mm -hmm. just so you have to pay double view. But what they will do is they'll be like, all right, he has only two mana up or he only has four mana up. How about we all pool our resources together to do so? And then eventually, like, yeah, you could, they, could, they could just pull, like, throw three removal spells on it, and then it will die. However, like, that's still great for you, because what I love is, is you're in blue, so you have vanishing, but then you have other backup means, and this buys you the time to draw into your other uh, backup plans, too. So vanishing will keep it around, and then you have a couple turns to figure out, okay, well, if your opponents all really want it dead, what am I going to do next? And you have those turns to actually figure that part out, which is nice. Oh, yeah. So I think we have time to do one more time around the table. So Tomer, me and you both had really big lists. So give me your give me your best remaining weird old card that you want to make sure gets in the cast. Okay. I want to give a one special shout out to Griffin Canyon. It's not relevant to any deck out there. Uh, except for changelings, but it's just a very cute card. Am I changing that to untap something? I think it plus plus one plus one until end of turn, I guess. But the real thing that I want to get the good word out there on is a call a card called Reverent Mantra. Reverent Mantra uh, costs four mana. It's three and a white. It's an instant, and it says you may exile a white card from your hand rather than pay the spell's mana cost. You can choose a color. All creatures gain protection from the chosen color until end of turn. Now, this card, sick. This card is basically it's not it's not quite force of will. You know, you have to exile something and then you get to cast it for free, which is great. That's what that's what makes the, the card good. But this is mass protection for oh, not all just your creature. entire bar for all creatures. all creatures. It is incredibly sneaky. So if anybody is having a targeted removal spell, uh, you can just cast the mantra and you know protect your your creatures from that targeted removal if your opponents are have have blockers that are only one color you can also uh activate this ability or cast a spell and then get around uh potential blockers this way because now they all have protection from that color uh if your opponents are attacking another opponent you can use this to also give pseudo evasion as well too if your opponents are casting anything like there's a couple there's a couple spells that are like choose a creature uh then you draw cards equal to the creature's power or something like that. I've actually oh. used this to deny it was like soul's majesty or something like that. I've used this to <laughs> yes. deny them drawing like 15 <laughs> cards off this. It's oh, hilarious. So good. Um and my favorite home for it, it was a deck that I actually gave Seth to play on Commander Clash. It's very good with the commander Belborka because Belborka says whenever you exile a card, uh that it, whenever you exile a card, it gets like the highest mana value of exile cards this turn. Uh, uh, it gets a power boost equal to the mana value of the highest mana value spell that was exiled this turn. So if you could like instant speed, you could just it, Reverend Mantra exile a very expensive spell in your hand. Like uh, Hour of Revelation would be six, uh, Onto Inversion would be eight. You know stuff like that. So you give you give uh, uh, Belborka protection and evasion, and then plus eight damage on top of that. It's it's really cute. So I really like it in. Well, obviously, white heavy decks. It removes That's auras really as well. Cool if you really yeah. need to get rid of your opponent's auras. 
Yes, it, yeah. it does knock off auras too. That's, <laughs> it's very good. <yeah. laughs> yeah, I hadn't really considered using this. There's like a trick with uh, vines of the vastwood that you used to see in modern sometimes where vines is like, it gives something hexproof, but it's worded in a weird way where you can target your opponent's creatures with it. Yeah. So you can give them hexproof and fizzle their own spells. This kind of does something similar. I hadn't really considered. I was thinking, oh, like this is just kind of bad protection, right? It's like protection, but if, if you're someone blasphemous acts or whatever, you're protecting everyone's creatures. So it's yeah, not really- like that awesome in that scenario but like being able to do all those little things knocking off or is fizzling your opponents like card draw effects and potentially like protecting your team alpha striking against monocolored opponents and it's free like being able to exile a white card from your hand really really nice and I, I got to shit out my MDFCs here because MDFCs <laughs> are lands that you can actually pitch to effects like yep. this. That's the way you can pitch one of your lands to Reverend Mana. So, so yeah, I'm going to have to try this card. I don't think I've ever put it in a deck, but uh, I think Is I'm going to try this one. Is it a It's from Macadian Masks. Is there's a... I think it's a cycle. What is the or maybe, I don't know. Do? Just <laughs> asking. Hmm. <laughs> I'm actually curious if it's a cycle. I, I bet it is, but maybe it's it's where misdirection most of the stuff there. Maybe it wasn't in Mercating Mask, but I remember there was also like misdirection came out sometime. Oh. I think it was in the Nemesis. So maybe it was oh, the God. block. What? There, there is a cycle. There is one of them, misdirection. Everyone okay, knows there it that is. one. This, yeah. So this is a blue member of that cycle. So you have misdirection, the blue one, which is kind of a counter spell. Unmask, which is the black one, which is oh. like a thought oh, season. Oh, right. Yeah. Caven, you can pitch a red card to deal t two damage to each creature and each player. And then the green one is Vine Dryad, a 1-3 uh, forest walker that you can play with Flash. <laughs> oh, very. <laughs> very. Ah, oh. All right. Maybe not every free spell is worth it. <laughs> Unmask was, was the most playable out of the bunch, if I'm, if, I was, right. if I'm correct. And yeah. Misdirection saw a lot of play, too. Like, that was like a backup force of will. It's kind of gotten power crept, I think, because we've gotten so many more free counters. I don't see misdirection much anymore, but you used to see that because you could misdirect someone's counter or something else. But uh, yeah, that's a that's a good choice. I'm gonna have to try Reverend Manta. Phil, what is your final choice right. for weird old One cards? Last card that I actually play in my Jada deck, which came up a bunch because there was a lot of black stuff. Another black card, Ritual of the Machine oh, yeah. from Alliances. It's very old. Sacrifice a creature to gain control of target non-black, non-artifact creature. Very short text box. Not even something they wouldn't really do today, although they really chill with the gain control stuff. In mono black, eh, you usually reanimate stuff instead. But my god, does it get some people. It kind of sucks that it's non-black because I've played this on a table where everybody else had a black commander, like some form of maybe uh -huh. Espo or something. But stealing commanders is just the most neck-breaking thing you can do to your <laughs> opponents. And this one does it in a pretty cool way, especially if you want to destroy, uh, <laughs> kill, like, sacrifice creatures. Yeah, and Arisa guys. Ah, I've seen you play it in Jadar. I remember this little oh, yeah. house. Mm. Oh, it seems super good in Jadar, yeah. If you have the easy bodies to sacrifice... It seems like a powerful effect. I that reminds me, I just bought this horrible, horrible collection, but it had this card I'd forgot about, which is Jabari's Influence. I don't know if you know what this card is, but it's it's kind of the white version of this. It's a five mana instant that you can only play after combat, and you gain control of target non artifact, non black creature that attacked you this turn oh, and put what? a negative one, negative zero counter on it. Oh, so it's just God. a five mana <laughs> mono white way to yeah way to steal a creature that attacked you. So that's one when I saw it, I'm like, I'm gonna have to try putting that oh in a God. in a deck because no one is going to expect that on a mono white like no one yes. expects you to just like thieve their creatures you so. can't even be <laughs> mad like that's that's no. amazing <laughs> Uh, I think Ritual of the Machine's better, though, probably, oh, yeah. because you have to, like, it's only four mana, and black decks kind of like to sacrifice stuff for value anyway. You have to the wait downside to of the white one is you do <laughs> yeah. have to be attacked, and it has to be <laughs> after combat, so you have to take the attack, too, before you can use it, but... Uh... I, is, okay, slightly aside, but Ritual of the Machine, is that like a Dalek or something that he's throwing flowers to? What's yeah, the art is very old and weird. It looks like a Dalek, and like somebody's handing flowers <laughs> to the Dalek. I don't know. Um, that, that's I my interpretation. Uh, <laughs> deeds performed in the depths of Soldu. It just looked like it's like a proposing. Uh, it's like a Valentine's date. It looks like the guy's just handing over. It's weird, right? Some flowers yeah. to a Dalek. I don't know. What's the What's the Doctor Who lore behind this? Let us know in the comment section. <laughs> Ooh, all bad. right, I I got. 
I got one last one last choice. And uh, like I said, my list is really big. I wanted to shout out like Constant Miss and Forbid because I really like those buyback spells. But I think I have to go with a card that actually may be the newest one on our list from Dissension. So we're talking 18 years ago now or something. Out. And the card is called Wars Toll. And I think this is a card that I've come to love because I got to play with Krim on Commander Clash every week. And you know Krim. <laughs> if you have a Krim in your play group, that person that's just... Always going to leave their mana up. Always try to counter all your spells. War's Toll is like the perfect answer to uh, to a player like that. So War's Toll, four mana red and jam it. It says whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, tap all the lands that player controls. And if a creature an opponent controls attacks, all creatures that opponent controls attacks if able. So the main value of this card, you can do some shenanigans in like goad style decks force attack style decks where this is a way that your opponent can't just like chip in with the other goaded creature they have to like swing with their entire team uh which gives you a lot of value if you're playing furk rag or any sort of goad style deck but i also just love it against control decks because what it means is once this is on the battlefield your opponents can't like tap out to play a mana rock tap out to play a creature or a planeswalker and then still leave up their counter spells if they want to do something during their main phase they're going to have to tap all their lands. And of course you can tap your lands in response. So this isn't going to like eat away their mana during their main phase. You just float all your mana and do what you want to do. But it's a way you can make sure the control player isn't just going to sit back and leave up their mana every single turn. So I really like this. If you have a, a crim in your group, if you have someone that's like constantly playing an instant speed and constantly playing a control style deck, we're still just a really good way to, uh, to make that player's day a little bit, a little bit tougher. I feel like if, if if you play this against Krim, he's just gonna save his counter spell just for your spell, yep. and that's uh... a <laughs> <laughs> he, he will not he's play anything the rest of the game just so we can counter your stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can counter this. That is that is true. That is the drawback. But have you guys ever tried playing? Uh, have you ever tried playing this card? We've seen. I have. Didn't we oh. see it on Clash? I played it recently on Clash. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's it looks very cute. I I really like the goat That's idea. Where if you can go one creature, you go to all of their creatures essentially. Well, yeah, they can attack you. Them all. Like, they're gonna yeah, be attacking be with gold, stuff but... they don't want to be attacking with, which is very right. Funny. <laughs> you can force force some bad attacks at your opponent, like because yeah. some creatures you kind of want to leave back, right? You, they have other value other than attacking. This is the way you force them into combat and can trade off with them. So, yeah, I think it's a card that's at least worth keeping in mind. It's not like a staple or anything. And honestly, I don't know if is, is there anything we talked about today that is a staple. I think most of these are kind of like was. good in specific decks. Mind's Eye might be one of the more generic of the bunch, but we talked about a lot of cards that like in the right archetype or in the right yeah. style of deck is going to be really, really strong. I don't think anything is uh, is something that I would just jam in every single deck that were close to it. I think if they were just generically good, they wouldn't be weird old cards. They'd just be like old staples. <laughs> They're just old, old cards. Power yeah. cards. They wouldn't be interesting because everybody would know about them already, right? Like these are all the <laughs> stuff that's like, it's good in this very specific situation. And like, yes, <laughs> that's what's fun. That's why people don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, I think that brings us to the end of our Commander Clash podcast for today. So thanks for hanging out, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks to uh, Card Conduit and also to Ultimate Guard for supporting the show. And we will be back next week to talk even more Commander. So until then, be good, everyone. Have a great week. And this is a crew signing out.